if you're ready, sir, we can start. So let's start, please. Um, it's a great pleasure, actually, to introduce Professor Larry Karen from Duke University. Larry is the chair of the WE department at Duke, but I've known Larry for the last, I think, almost 20 years through ONR's interaction, and one of the um, impressions, at least I have, of Larry's work is in terms of helping me as a program officer in terms of deciding what are some of the key ideas that, that are ready to be funded or should be funded. And this, I think, is one of those topics as well. So thank you so much for coming, and please go ahead. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Um, so sir, it's a real pleasure um, to be here at the Academy. Um, I don't think I've ever spoken here. I've been here before. but. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, and uh, um, the Naval Academy was always kind of a special place, always viewed as a special place. So it's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. So um, uh, I'm going to talk to you um, about uh, some work that um, is is at the intersection of uh, mathematics, um, statistics, and um, physical cameras. So. Um, so this is um, this this work is about how uh, mathematics and statistics can make an impact on a, on a real physical system, um, and so uh, so I'm I'm the first guy, and, and Guillermo Shapiro is a, is an image processing person um, at Duke, and um, David Brady is uh, is a camera maker, and um, so uh, what we're doing as a group is trying to build new, new types of, um, of cameras that can do things um, uh, a, uh, All right, I guess I'm running on battery. Let me just plug this thing in. Okay, so, um, so what, what, um, you know, I only have about 50 minutes, and, and uh, there's a, there's a lot of stuff here. So, um, rather than just going through a whole bunch of math, um, I thought I would just kind of. Um, Give you a sense of what we can do, um, and, uh, and 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 the way I kind of view this is it's it's kind of a, a series of uh, kind of magic tricks, um, and I, I think that um, when you look at it, it's it's almost magic. I think um, that it works. So I'm going to turn off the lights. I think so I'm going to show you some color pictures, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of walk through a bunch of like kind of tricks, magic tricks. And um, uh, and then I'm going to tell you how we do the magic. Okay? And, and then the, 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 the secret to the, to the magic, of course, um, is math. But um, before we um, go into all the mathematical detail, which is um, somewhat involved, um, maybe I, I'd like to try to motivate you a little bit. Okay? So, um, let me let me show you um, um, a few pictures. Okay, so um, so I hope you can see that fairly well. Um, on the on the right is a is a picture um, of a castle in um, in Europe, and um, I'm told it's a very famous castle. Um, and um, on the left is that same castle, but, um, but on the left you're only observing 20% um, of the voxels uniformly at, at random. Okay, so um, we're only observing 20% of the data on left, at left. And then um, in, in the middle is, is what we can recover from the left. Okay, so this is, this is the, 
um, the first uh, uh, trick, if you will. So, so the question is, how can we go um, from something um, on the left and recover um, what you see in the middle, which is a, a very, very good rendering of the original, which is um, at right. Okay? And, and the way that we can do this is, is the fact that um, there is a lot of redundancy uh, or structure that, that exists in the data that um, we can leverage and exploit. And if we can uncover that, um, uh, that structure, then it turns out that we don't need nearly as much data to recover the um, image at, in the middle as you might um, otherwise uh, think you would need. And so what this kind of suggests is that we can um, rethink the way cameras um, are made. So the way that cameras have been made pretty much from the very first camera was that the data was collected in a way that it could be visualized by humans immediately, right off the camera, right? So, um, uh, you know, our, whenever you take data with a conventional camera, a, a digital camera, you measure RGB, uh, red, green, blue, um, at a series of pixels, right? And then, and then if, once you measure that, you can show it to a human immediately. And so, um, on, the, on, the, on the left, however, is what we're going to advocate in, in some sense, although not exactly like that. But in any case, it doesn't look like anything a human would um, want to look at. All right? But the, the advantage of the left is, is that the amount of data that I have to collect is much less. Okay? So, the, the revolution that um, has been going on in, um, in compressive sensing and in um, computational photography is the understanding that if we're willing to compute, um, the amount of data that we need to measure can be substantially reduced. Um, alternatively, we can recover much more information from a given, a, a, from a, a measurement that you're already taking than you would um, get if you um, processed it um, naively. Okay, and I'll explain that um, in a second. So um, if you look at this, um, there's, there's really no reason to actually do this on this, on this uh, example because um, Kodak and others will be more than happy to sell you an RGB camera that will work just fine. And so there's, there's no reason to actually do this, right? So this is just purely um, a trick and a demonstration. It's, it's easy. Um, it's, it's, um, Easy, you know, it's easy for me to demonstrate that to you. Here, here's another example where um, the, the left is the original image, the right is, the, uh, is a contaminated image, contaminated because there's uh, text over top of it, and then the bottom is, um, is the recovered image. Okay? And so this is um, another trick, if you will, that we can um, perform. Um, basically recovering missing data. Um, and if you think about it, that's really what we're doing here, right? So um, the fact that I can go from the left image to the middle image means that I can recover a lot of missing information by exploiting structure in the data. Um, I can recover the middle image. Um, in a similar way, a different application, um, the text on the top right is, is obviously blocking pixels. I, I don't get to see them, but um, I'm able to recover um, this image very well. Um, if, you, if you look at that, if you look at the top right and you look at the bottom and you look at it carefully it, and you look at the quality of the recovery, it's actually pretty remarkable, right? Because we're, we're completely blocking a lot of stuff. A lot of detail in this area has been completely blocked out, but yet we, we can recover it. So what this suggests is, is that there must be some underlying structure in the data that if we could recover that structure, we don't need to measure as much stuff as we would naively um, think to do. This application, the, um, the reason I actually put these slides in, 
is because I was briefing at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and um, a problem that they have is that um, whenever they, and this is a, this is a DOD problem, the, the, the sensors that, are, that they fly, they, they record the time, they record a whole bunch of data, and they just put it directly on the image. And they do it, you know, I guess for some convenience, right, because there's no doubt what time of day it was or whatever, because it's right there. But it also blocks, it blocks stuff, right? And so this is a fundamental problem for them. And, and so um, we've actually transitioned this to Livermore and it essentially solved their problem. So um, this, this, is a real, this is a real problem. Um, so, um, so let me now um, show you the, the, um, the last magic trick, which is our latest magic trick. And um, it's the one that um, we're most excited about because it's our latest, of course. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's really pretty cool. But let me, uh, before I can show you that, let me just show you one more thing over here. So this is, this is a, a, another application that is, um, is quite relevant to the DoD. So um, the RGB camera that I, um, you know, that I did my first trick on, you, you would never do that, right? Because you could, why would you do that? You could just measure the RGB pixels, right? Um, and, the ca and you can buy many cameras very inexpensively that are on this thing, right? That'll be happy to take that picture for you. So why would you do that? You, you wouldn't do that. But there are systems that the government flies that you guys know more about than I do that deploy hyperspectral um, cameras. So in, in this case, this data was collected by the Army for the National Geospatial Agency. This is 162 spectral bands. This is um, a place in Maryland. Um, and, and what I'm showing you is on the top left is the original image at one of the 162 spectral bands. I, I don't know how to, it's, it's a, there's 162 bands, right? So I, I, I don't know how to show, I can show you a movie, but it would take more time than it's worth. So that's just one band. Now, the magic trick that I'm showing you here is I'm going to observe 2% of the data cube. So this is a spatial spectral data cube. And um, we're going to observe 2% of the data cube uniformly at random. Okay? And um, so it's kind of hard to see. Uh, hopefully you can see. But it's basically not the dots. Right? And um, we have many ways of doing this magic trick. So these are four different ways of doing it. Um, they all work extremely well. This is the one we like the most. Um, if you look at this, and you look at the top left, um, there's very, very close agreement between them. I'm able to recover this from that. All right. But the thing is, is that I'm not just doing it at one spectral band. I'm doing this at all 162 spectral bands simultaneously. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how, how I, I do this, but this, this is actually a trick that's quite relevant to the DoD because it's, it's very um, expensive to build cameras to collect this data, and moreover, it's very time-consuming to pull the data off of, off of the camera. And so what this is saying is several things. It says, first of all, you don't have to pull all the data off of the camera. Just pull 2% of it at random. I'll be fine. That's, that's, that's one thing. Um, secondly, once you know that, you might redesign the camera altogether. Why, why put all those pixels, which are very expensive to deploy? And then finally, for the person who builds cameras, it's actually very difficult to build a camera for which every single pixel at all 162 spectral bands work properly. So like if you're, if you're a semiconductor person, to actually build that camera and make it work is, is expensive. And so there are a lot of chips that are thrown away because they're imperfect from one reason or another. What this is saying is that we can take highly um, degraded data off of the camera and recover the underlying uh, imagery, just like we did where the text was written over, um, over, uh, over, over the document. Okay, so this is, this is something that actually the NGA is, is very interested in because um, this is an extreme
case of what really happens on their cameras, on their real physical cameras. Um, it's very improbable that all 162 spectral bands, every single pixel, is going to work perfectly. They, they, they just have dropouts. And so the ability to recover the underlying information is, uh, uh, is important. The, okay. The recovered image looks sharper than the original. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, um, so actually, um, it is. It actually denoises. So um, our recovered image oftentimes is better than the original because when we do the recovery, we're denoising uh, simultaneously with doing the recovery. I'll, I'll explain how we do that. So it's debatable. You, maybe it's not better. I don't know. But it's sharper to the eye. And um, maybe that's not truth, right? But um, it's not clear what truth is, right? But um, uh, whenever we do the recovery, we do denoising simultaneously. And so even if you were to measure the original image, we can denoise it. But we're not, I mean, that, that we could do that for free. But uh, we're advocating um, not, um, not measuring it for a price. OK, so now let me show you my, my last magic trick, and then we'll do a little bit of math. And I'll tell you how, how we do this. Okay, so all of these tricks um, that I've shown you here are, are just that tricks, right? They're you know, missing pixels, text writing over stuff. And they're, they're, they're nice, and nice applications, but um, they may be limited in their use, right? So, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what we think is a, a really interesting application of of this ma mathematics and, and this technology. So the problem um, is, is the following. You're, you're a scientist, and you want to measure video, let's say, at 5,000 frames a second. Okay, so you're, you're, you, know, you're, you work for the Navy, and you want to see how an IED explodes. You, know, you want to see that, that process. You need a 4,000 frames per second camera to do that. Right? or whatever other thing that you, you've got a jet engine, you, know, you want to you observe it at 5,000 frames a second. So, um, so all this math says I don't need to actually measure it at 4,000 frames per second. I can still recover it. So that's kind of canalizing. So maybe I can use an existing camera, which is much slower than a 5,000 frames per second camera, and yet recover 5,000 frames per second. All right? And so this is actually what we've done. So we've taken a conventional off-the-shelf video camera, which collects data at uh, 30 frames a second, and we've converted it into a camera, changing none of the optics, which collects data at 5,000 frames per second. Okay? Um, so we, we think this is um, incredibly cool. Um, and uh, to do that, you have to make one pretty minor modification to the camera, and you got to do math. Okay, so that's what we're here to do: is talk about math. Let me show you that video, and um, let me show you the, the uh, video. See that fairly well. Not too bad. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is this: we're going to collect data at 30 frames a second, and we're going to turn it into a video that runs at 5,000 frames a second. Okay. And um, on the right is the original data collected at 30 frames a second, and on the left is the recovered uh, video. And, um, uh, and, and what's going to happen is, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it too well, but on the right, nothing is going to change at all. Because at 30 frames per second, nothing is changing at that rate. Okay? And then at left, we're going to get 148 frames. Okay? So we're going to take data at 30 frames a second, 
for every single frame of 30 frames a second, we're, rec we're going to recover 148 frames. Okay? And if you do the math, that's about 5,000 frames a second. So what you're going to see is this is Patrick Lowell. It's our student. Uh, he's a first-year graduate student. Okay, so this is, um, is first-year graduate student work, right? The math was done by a more senior person, but, but the camera was actually made by a first-year first year grad student. So um, I'm going to play the video, but what I want you to notice is that he's going to blink. Actually, his eyes going to open. Okay. So um, on the right, which is the original data, you, you can't see that because it's time. There's it's a single frame. So from a single frame, we're going to go to 148. This is a little bit easier to see, I think. Um, on the right is data collected by a 30 frames per second camera. Um, and so what you're going to see is, is that these frames are going to change relatively slowly because they're going to be 30 frames per second. On the left, where we're going to recover 148 frames for every single one of those frames. Okay, And what you're seeing is you're, you're seeing uh, D-U-K-E written on a spinning wheel. And that, frame, that wheel is spinning fast enough that at 30 frames a second you can't even, it's just a blur. Okay? And on the left, you're gonna, you, you, you'll hopefully see it um, pretty clear. Covering that continuously moving uh, uh, spinning wheel uh, at left at about 5,000 frames a second, and at right is what we actually um, measure. Right? And we've we've actually these, these these results are actually pretty old. Uh, we've cleaned up the video quite a bit, but um, if you look at the right, none of None of it is clear at all. It's all kind of blurred, right? But yet we're able to recover um, uh, well, the video very, um, pretty effectively. Okay. So, um, so we think this is actually really cool because um, what it says is that you could take a conventional um, slow camera and convert it into um, a fast camera with relatively minor um, changes So, um, and not a whole lot of time to talk about it. So I'm just going to kind of give you a, um, a little bit of a flavor um, of what we're doing, okay, and, and how we do these, these various tricks. So um, 
what I, I think um, I'll, I'll do is, is start out with just kind of explaining how um, how we do this. Okay, so what we're what we're given is uh, is is the imagery um, at left. Okay, and um, and in fact, we use the same technique to solve this problem, to solve that problem. solve that problem. We're going to do them all, all the same way, basically the same way. And, and the way we do this is we take the, 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 um, the image and we break it up into, into small blocks. And so here, um, these are 8 by 8 blocks. This is um, for natural imagery, um, like the castle and the one with the text. For the hyperspectral data, um, the blocks are, are usually smaller, like three by three spatially. Uh, and that's because we have 162 spectral bands, so you, you have a lot of spectral information, so we, we don't need to use as much um, spatial information. So, so, but in any case, if you look at a conventional RGB um, image, we break it up into um, eight by eight uh, blocks, and we consider all possible blocks. So we consider the canonical grid, which I show you here, but actually every possible shift of all of the patches. So therefore, we have a tremendous amount of data. Okay. So despite the fact that if you, if you look at this, you, you would say we're very, very poor on data because I get to process the left, the left image is what I get to process. But actually, whenever we parameterize it the way we do, terms of these patches, and I consider every single patch, I have millions of patches just for a single image. And one thing I, I, I haven't said yet is that the magic trick is done with no training whatsoever. The only thing I process is the image that's given to me. Okay? So um, the way that we do this is by using some, some prior knowledge about um, about data, and, and so um, we're using something called dictionary learning. Are, are you guys, uh, anybody studying that or working on that, dictionary learning? Okay. Um, okay, it, it, it turns out that it's a pretty, it's a, it's a very um, uh, popular um, uh, area now of applied math and statistics. So let me, let me um, explain this to you. Okay, XI, is, is the ith patch in this image. So it's worth spending just a little bit of time on this because actually all of my magic tricks pretty much come down to this. Details are different in each of the problems, but pretty much comes down to this. So, so xi in this case is an 8 by 8 by 3 vector, 192. <coughs> 8, 8 spatial, 3, 3 spectral, right? Whenever I do the hyperspectral data, we typically would go two by two by 162, right? Um, two spatial, two spatial, 162, or maybe three, three, but not eight, eight, because um, for those of you who study hyperspectral data, if you, if you make the patch size too big, you get spectral blurring, because there could be just a single pixel that has a unique spectral signature, and you don't want to mess that up, okay? But in any case, for the RGB, we have XI is a 192 dimensional vector. And I only get to see 20% of that vector, okay? Because in my example, I, I, I got to see 20% of it uniformly at random. The key thing to think about is that if I remove pixels uniformly at random, then what is missing from XI is different from what is missing from XI prime and XJ, right? In general, it's going to be different because that's random. So the, so the deal is, is that it's like I have a whole bunch of people, a million people. Each of them has a 192 dimensional vector in their pocket. But for each person, 20% of that vector is missing. But it's a different 20% for everybody. So you would think if I get to see enough people, I should be able to figure out what's, what's, what's missing. That's the key idea, right? We can do that as long as 
the data, the 192 dimensional feature vectors that's in everybody's pockets, they have some underlying structure. If they're all completely random, then I, I'm not going to learn anything from looking at this guy's and that guy's, right? But if there's underlying structure, you would think that if I got to see enough of these vectors and they have different parts missing at random, I should be able to infer the underlying structure and therefore I should be able to infer the missing data. Okay, this is, the, this is yes. But you control what missing part there is. So there's so information about the location of what is so, so the data is uniformly missing at random, literally by, whenever we generate the data, it's literally a random draw. And um, then w when I get to do my math, I know what's missing. Now the thing is, is that um, when we do this problem, I don't exactly know what's missing. But it's pretty easy because it's red, right? So. Um, so, so that's, it's, that's basically it, is that you, you take the big, you take the big um, data cube image, break it up into small guys. Why do we break it up into small guys? So this is, this is really the key, key thing. If I give you a 256 by 256 matrix by three, right, three colors, RGB, and I ask you to statistically model that, it could be anything, right? I could take a picture here, take a picture here. Take, no way I can model that. No chance. However, if I break it down to eight by eight, it's quite likely that there's some structure that's repeated, so-called self-similarity. That if I take a picture of those flowers and I take a picture of this you know, over here, to a remarkable extent, there's a lot of structure that you can share and learn between them. And so what you have to do is you have to make these patches small enough so that they, they have structure that can be shared. They can't be too complicated. On the other hand, if you make them too small, then they're, they're, they're too naive. And so it turns out that 8x8 is a good, is a good size. And, and, and by the way, 8x8 is the, JPG, J, the JPEG standard, right? So, um, we, we looked at this very carefully, 16, 16, 32, 32, 4, 4. Turned out that 8 by 8, miraculously, worked the best. And, and almost certainly the JPEG guys did that exact study that we did. OK, so now, how do we, how do, we do this? So I, basically what I'm saying is, if we make the patches small enough, here, 8 by 8 by 3, there should be some structure that is shared. So what do I mean by that in a precise way? So what we're saying is that every one of these patches can be represented as a linear combination of dictionary elements, d sub k. So d sub k is a 192-dimensional vector. It's the k. It's the k dictionary element. Okay. So um, while you haven't studied dictionary learning, you have done things like TCA. So one option would make those dictionary elements PCA basis. Um, you, you don't want to do that, actually. Um, another option would be to make them the wavelet basis. Um, you don't want to do that either. Um, it, it turns out, um, so let me, let me, so why not, right? Why not? Why not use wavelets? So um, wavelets are beautiful things, but Wavelets are, can be used to represent anything, pretty much anything, right? And so that's kind of bad in a sense because I'm looking at images, right? So let's, let's build dictionary elements that are associated with images. We should do better than wavelets, right? Because wavelets just turn out to be an orthonormal basis, which is a nice thing, and they can be used to represent any signal. But I know I'm looking at images, so let's, let's build dictionaries that are representative um, of, of, of the images. So the other alternative would be to use principal component analysis, uh, Kahunin and Loeb type decompositions. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with that. The thing that is wrong with that is, is that if you use PCA or KLT type basis, 
you're assuming that every one of those patches lives in the same linear subspace spanned by the principal components, right? So think about that. It says that every one of these patches is, is in the same linear subspace. Why, why should that be the case? Maybe, and, and it turns out that it is true, maybe these patches should live on a manifold, right? That they, they don't live in a linear subspace. They live on a manifold, and in fact, they do, okay? And so, so what's happening is, is that what we're saying is that every one of these patches is represented as a linear combination of dictionary elements. ZIK is a binary indicator which tells us whether the K dictionary element is used to represent the ith data. And we, and, and we want ZI, Z, uh, uh, ZI is a binary vector which tells us the support of the dictionary elements. We want that to be sparse, okay? And um, so we, we want we want the um, the zi the, the zi zi is a binary vector of ones and zeros, and we want that to be almost all zeros and just a few ones. Those few ones tell us which dictionary is used to represent xi, and then the wik. Is, is a real value which tells us the weight, okay? And so um, in dictionary learning, what we're doing is we're saying, let's learn, and, and by the way, so notice that um, this goes k equal one to infinity, um, so you might be concerned about that infinity, right? Um, so um, I'm not gonna probably get into the details, but um, one of the real questions that comes up when you do this types of analysis is how many dictionary elements should you use, okay? Um, so one thing, so there are just a few, I, 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 obviously my only goal here is to convey a few ideas, right? Um, You're gonna have to go read the papers to get the details, but there are a few ideas that I wanna convey to you, okay? A few, few important points. Okay, so first one, we're gonna represent every one of the data in terms of a set of dictionaries, I don't know the dictionary a priori. I'm going to learn the dictionary. I'm going to learn it based upon the data that I'm looking at, the noisy, contaminated data. And this is, then I'm going to add a residual, and I'm going to learn that residual, and I'm going to remove that. So I actually will get a cleaner image than the original, because I'm going to remove that, that noise. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the, there are two things that come up that are kind of important. Number one, how many dictionary elements do I need? And, and um, so notice I, I say infin infinity. Um, infinity just means unbounded, which means I, I don't really know how many. And we've developed techniques, which I won't get into, that allow us to infer how many dictionary elements we actually need, okay? So when I say in infinite, what that means is I don't have to set it a priori. I'm gonna learn it. It's, it's unbounded, but I, it, it is always finite but within the model, I treat it as unbound. Okay, so in dictionary learning, I'm gonna show you in a second a little bit of the math of how we do this. But there's, there's one key thing that I, I wanna convey, because most of you said you had not heard about dictionary learning. So, so let, let, me, let me, you know, one of the real key takeaways is, 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 is the following. Whenever we um, use an orthonormal basis, like wavelengths, the number of basis vectors is equal to the dimensionality of the data, right? So the number of wavelet coefficients is equal to the number of the, 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 the size of the data. Um, and, and when we do p, so that's one extreme, or I don't know if it's an extreme, but it's, that's one situation. When we do PCA, or Cohen and Loeb, the number of, of, of principal components that we usually take is, is small is smaller than the amount of data we have. And um, that's actually gonna be very bad for data like this because that, again, it assumes that the data lives in a low dimensional linear subspace, which is not true. So the key thing that I, you know, one of the key things I want you to take away is that the number of dictionary elements that are needed to represent the data is larger than the dimensionality of the data. So these are, these are called overcomplete uh, uh, 
dictionaries. And what that suggests is that the data lives on a manifold. So that there are, the, the number of decays is larger than the dimensionality of the data. But remember, we have sparsity here, which is encouraging that for any given data xi, only a small subset of the dictionaries are used. And so what this is doing, if you think about this, is it's saying that all of the data live on a manifold. And any one data lives on a portion of that manifold where the space of the data on that portion of the manifold is spanned by the small set of dictionary elements that are actually used there. Okay? So, so this is um, a manifold model. So let me um, try to give you a little bit of a sense um, of how we uh, do this. So this is actually not exactly how we do it. And, and it's a little bit too involved, I think, to, to, to get into. I'm happy to talk offline, but um, it's a little bit involved. To, to, so I, I, I'm going to try to just kind of keep it simple. So um, assume that we have capital N patches. OK, so remember those patches. Um, I consider all possible patches. I have capital N of them. Xi is the i patch. D, capital D, is my dictionary. The columns of the dictionary are D sub 1, D sub 2, D sub 3, D sub k. Those are what I showed you before. And the SI is the weight. This is, these are the weights on the dictionary elements to, to represent the i data. Okay? So, so the, the, the kind of the obvious thing to do is let's design the dictionary and let's find the weights on that dictionary such that the Euclidean distance between the data and the data representation is minimized. Right? Totally reasonable. I'm sorry, can, are those sort of like, like Bayesian information criteria in terms of the log terms? Oh, yeah. Totally. Thank you. Uh, that's exactly what it is. So, so like I said, we don't exactly do this. Um, uh, this is actually, um, this is what most people do. Um, so I, I like to talk about this because at least I can make connections, right? Um, uh, but uh, we, we do, we actually take a Bayesian perspective and, and, and do it that way. But, um, okay, but, but this will give, certainly give you the flavor. I'm not, I'm, I'm definitely not hiding anything from you. And, and um, what we do is just kind of fancier versions of this. This works perfectly fine. Right? I mean, we're all we're academics, right? So we have to, we have to try new things. And, and what we do, I think, is, is better from many perspectives. But that's not to say this isn't good. This is, this is actually very good. And, and it gives you totally the intuition of what's going on. So if you understand this, you understand 90% of it. So what it's saying is this. You're given n patches. Despite the fact that 98% of that hyperspectral data is gone, I don't even have it, Think about how many patches I have in a hyperspectral data cube whenever the patches spatially are only two by two or three by three. I have like millions of patches. So I got tons and tons of data. And I'm saying, okay, any one of these guys is represented as a linear combination of the columns of D, where these are the SIs, that are the weights on the i data. Let's build that dictionary. Let's find those weights such that the Euclidean distance minimize. Completely, totally obvious, right? But the thing is, is that if we don't regularize this, if we don't put constraints on the columns of D and on um, SI, there's no way you're going to solve that problem. All right. So the the key the key observation. So let me let me say that again. If if we don't put constraints on D and SI, we can't solve this problem. And, and the reason is, is that because the number of unknowns would be more than the data I have. All right, but remember, the game was I'm going to have a million people. Each of them are going to have a 192-dimensional vector in their pocket, and each of them is going to have missing data. I get to look at everybody, and then I make inferences about relationships, right? And then I can, I can infer the missing data. I can only do that if there's some low-dimensional structure that I can exploit. And I, I need to impose that. There's nothing in this that imposes that structure. 
And so the key, the key observation that has been made over the last 10 years, so, so L1, everybody knows about L1, right? So, so L1 is like revolutionized mathematics over the last decade or so. What we're going to do is we're going to put an L1 regularization on SI. Okay, so this was somewhat of a, of a revolution because previously everybody did L2, which was um, with ticking off regularization. So L1 um, is a little harder, um, but what it does is it imposes that the SIs are sparse, which means that only for any one data SI, only a small subset of the dictionaries are actually used because SI is sparse. And then finally, we regularize the DK. This is um, a, a widely um, used constraint. Um, so um, in any case, this is, a, this is the L2 regularization. So basically what the model says is given the data, learn a dictionary, and then every one of the data is represented as a linear combination of dictionary elements. Let's impose that the dictionary elements, that the, the weights on the dictionary are sparse, and then we're going to regularize the dictionary. That's it. Okay? Um, and that's basically, if you do that, you can pretty much solve um, all of the um, problems uh, that, um, that I talked about. So are there any, any questions about that? So, so that, that actually explains three of my four magic tricks. This doesn't tell you how I did the video. So I, I want to just quickly tell you how I did the video. And then um, uh, we'll be done. But before I, before I go on to that, are there any questions about this? The last line you have, be, below the regularization you have, what does it Yeah, so um, you have two other expressions. Yeah, so um, uh, so what happens is this. Um, there, there are pretty much two worlds of, of this, of this, of this uh, problem. One world is optimization, the other is Bayesian, right? We, we take a Bayesian perspective. Um, but let me, let me explain um, what everybody else does. So um, P... P here represents the, the, the dimensionality of the number of pixels. So here P is just a number. It's 192 in our case. And then lambda is, is, um, is, is, a, is, a, is a regularization constant, which is related to the Laplace prior. And gamma E is also a regularization parameter, which is related to the noise level in the data. So an optimization person doesn't have any of this stuff. And they just say, OK, fit the data, sparsity on the weights, L2 on the dictionary. Do they set gamma and lambda? So the thing is, they, they don't know how to set lambda and gamma. So what they have to do is some sort of cross-validation. They have to, you know, I, I'll give you a picture of that castle. I'll tell you 20% of the pixels are missing at random. They don't know how to set the lambda and gamma, but at least they understand the problem. So then they'll go out and take a whole bunch of pictures. They'll try this. They'll find gamma and lambda that work pretty well. They'll use that and just hope for the best. Right? Um, so that's the optimization world. In the Bayesian world, what we do is we say, OK, we're going to put a prior on lambda. We're going to put a prior on gamma. And these are gamma priors. And, and we don't do any cross-validation, and we're able to infer distributions for gamma and lambda based upon the data itself. Okay, so that's what so so what happens is this this expression right here, this whole thing, is meant to tell all the optimization guys who don't understand anything we're doing, um, for the most part, that we're not doing something very different than you guys. This is this is more of a uh, peace offering to, to <coughs> these guys, right? Um, because I talk to, you know, I give a lot of talks, and, and most of the people are not Bayesians, right? And, um, and so I, I, I kind of like to show people that actually what we're doing is very much what they're doing. But what we do is these, um, these allow us to place priors on lambda and gamma and allow us to infer. 
Okay. Okay. So let me let me now. Any other questions? Okay. So I, I told you every I told you three of my four magic tricks. So I'm going to tell you my last the uh, last uh, trick before we're uh, kicked out of here. Okay. So um, so this is this is a coat. This is a coated aperture. Um, uh, where you see black, photons are blocked, and where you see white, it's just trans, just, it's just transmissive, and um, it's 50% black, 50% white, uniformly at random. Okay, and this is kind of counterintuitive, um, except for the fact that coded apertures are a widely used thing in optics. Um, but uh, to an average guy like me, this seems completely counterintuitive. Um, we're going to take that 30 frames per, per second camera, and we're going to put that put that in front of it. Okay, which means we're going to block half of the photons. And what I'm going to now quickly show you is that if we do that in a smart way, magic can occur. Okay. And so it's it's so so that's the code. Just so you know what the code is. And let me let me explain to you. Um, so, so by the way, we've also built a hyperspectral camera. I'm not telling you anything about that. Um, we, we, we're pretty proud of that too, um, but I don't have time to talk about that. Okay, so here, here is the camera. Okay, um, this was put together by by first semester graduate student in about two months. All right, good student, but but still, it, it, not a whole lot of knowledge, but. Uh, um, he was able to do it, so it's pretty simple. Take a conventional camera, take that code that I showed you, put that code on, put it in front of the lens. So this seems like a really stupid thing to do because we're blocking half of the, the uh, photons. But the smart thing is this. We're going to vibrate that code on a piezoelectric translator at 5,000 frames a second. Okay, so what's happening is, is that my camera is collecting, is summing up photons at a rate of 30 frames a second. But what's happening is that we're modulating those, the, those photons at 5,000 frames a second. And so then you might think that since the modulation is occurring at a very fast rate, and since I showed you that you don't actually have to collect all of the data to recover the information. It turns out that we can do de the um, decoding and then recover the underlying video at 5,000 frames a second. So, so the deal is that we're going to code at a very high frame rate, but we're going to measure at a low frame rate, 30 frames a second, conventional, conventional camera. All right, so this is, this is what you do if you get a call from CBS Sports and they tell you you're going to be photographing the United States Open Tennis Championship and we want you to be able to show us the ball hitting the line. Uh, you know, you got to do that. Um, and by the way, you got to use a 30 frames per second camera. All right, so, you know, of course that's not going to happen, but you might be in your laboratory at the Naval Academy and there is something you would love to see at 5,000 frames per second. You have a 30 frames per second camera, and, and Reza will not buy you a 5,000 frames per second camera. But yet, you'd like to see it at 5,000 frames per second. So this is how you do it, all right? So we, we think this is pretty magical because um, uh, it's, it's a way for us to get very high frame rate video using a conventional camera with a slight modification. So we, we have all kinds of um, other um, results. Um, and so this is, this is just a little bit um, of, what, of, what's, um, of what's happening. So there's an underlying video. So this is that, that Duke video that I showed you before. And what's happening is, is that whenever that code is moving at 5,000 frames a second, it's taking this original data and it's multiplying it by ones and zeros. 
where, where photons are blocked and not blocked. And then the math is, is that they're all summed together. So we're going to multiply this by ones and zeros, and that by ones and zeros, and that by ones and zeros, but different ones and zeros because the code is moving. We then sum them all together, and we get that. And so it turns out that this is basically what we're doing with compressive sensing. We're taking a vector of data, doing some sort of a projection, get a low dimensional measurement, and then doing mathematics and exploiting the fact that this guy can be represented each of the patches. And so that the stuff I talked about on patches, that's not, comp it's not orthogonal, it's not a separate piece of work. We use exactly the same thing here. So then what we do is we take this guy, we break it up into patches, exactly the same way we did before. We model each of those patches using dictionary elements. And we know that every one of those patches is represented by a sparse set of dictionary elements. And then we're able to um, recover the video. Okay? So let me, let me um, just close um, by, um, by playing that video one more time. So we kind of feel like this is this is almost magical. That you can go from the right, which is collected at 30 frames a second, and we can recover the left, which is at about 5,000 frames per second. And we, we need to upgrade our videos. We, we, we've got many more videos. We've subsequently gone to color. We have, it's all now in color. Um, and have some really nice results. So um, uh, this is, this is um, a very simple modification to a camera with some interesting mathematics that allows us to turn a relatively simple off-the-shelf camera into uh, really a state-of-the-art um, high speed camera. So um, with that, I will stop and answer any questions anybody might have. Okay. How long did the rendering take this? So, I mean, how long did it to, to actually compute, you mean, the, the computation? So this is um, pretty fast. I mean, we run into some like the laptop computer so in, in minutes. So, that, so actually, it's, it's, it's very fast. And, so and one, one second took two minutes, roughly? Uh, um, roughly, let's we can say that. But, but that's, you know, the, I, I, I don't want you to think that that's any kind of limit. We, we run it in MATLAB, completely non-optimized on a single laptop computer, right? There, it, it turns out that all of those patches can be processed in parallel, right? Because there, so this is something that can, if you if you do a parallel implementation, you can make it extraordinarily fast. We haven't done that. So so we think we can make it real time. So we, we haven't. It's, it's it's actually if you look at the math and you look at what we did, it's pretty clear that with some engineering you can make it real time. And, and we we haven't done that. Um, we've been focusing on other things. Open your dictionary. I imagine some of them must be virtual, but there must be other shapes that they're Yeah, that's a good question. All right, so let me um, show you. basic colors at the beginning. So, so um, they're organized from top left down in, in, in their importance, which means the frequency of usage. So um, just prime colors and then um, some more structured things. Now, it, it, this is um, actually a pretty complicated 
So what, what happens is, is that the more complicated the image, the simpler the dictionary elements, because um, the, the image is just rather complicated. So if you, if you remember, my dictionaries are going to be shared across all of them. So if you take such a complicated thing, it turns out that the dictionary elements um, are, are rather simple. Um, but if you look at like some of the classic images in image processing, such as Barbara and Lena, so if you know these images, they have, like Barbara in particular has has very clear striping behavior. And if I show you the dictionary elements that we learn on Barbara, they they really look like stripes. And so those are things that are not really captured in wavelets. That's why we do much much better than wavelets because um, they, we get very clear structure that is tied to the um, characteristics of the data. And the hyperspectral. Um, you know, some of the hyperspectral signatures are characteristic of certain materials. And by putting, by learning a dictionary, you again do much better than wavelets because you're learning the structure of the spectral um, signature. And likewise, when we do the dictionary learning for the video, um, we again take patches, but now it's, it's not space wavelength, it's space time. And you get characteristic motions Know, in, in the video. How fun would it be if you had used uh, wavelets, for example, to compare with what you've done? Have you, have you done? Yeah, we've done that. Um, uh, if you do, if you if you um, are careful with what you do, the wavelets actually can perform pretty well. We we um, uh, we for the video. So so for um, for the still imagery. Um, the wavelets are not competitive with dictionary learning. Um, for video, we have made the wavelets pretty competitive. Um, and, and, and what we do actually is we do wavelets in 2D spatial, and then we do DCT in time. It turns out that that works better because there's a smoothness in time that the DCT captures better. So um, you, could, you could do um, wavelet type stuff. But you cannot do naive wavelet stuff. You have to be very sophisticated in how you model the wavelet coefficients. And, and that, that modeling is actually perhaps as hard or sophisticated as the dictionary learning itself. So the dictionary learning is actually pretty simple. So we kind of like that. And it's ubiquitous. We, we use the same methods to, the same dictionary methods are, have been used successfully to analyze RGB data, hyperspectral data, video data, um, audio data. So it's just a very general concept. And um, the codes can be used almost interchangeably, I mean, just without any changes. Whereas with wavelets, you can do it, but you've got to be careful about how you model the wavelet coefficients. So you've got to be sensitive to, to the domain of the problem that you're looking at. So. Um, the dictionary learning has really taken over the field. In the image processing now, uh, in video processing, um, everybody's doing dictionary learning. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Professor Kevin again.